Hello, and welcome back to Communicate Like a Give a Damn. I'm your host, Kim Clark. It's a pleasure to be here. It's an extra special guest that we have today. Uh, we have Lily Zhang. And Lily, we're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about their book. We're also going to talk about the article that they contributed in our book, The Conscious Communicator, The Fine Art of Not Saying Stupid Shit. Um, for some reason, Lily, I name things with swear words in it. I really don't swear this much, but you know what? I'm passionate about this subject. I'm not going to apologize for it. <laughs> Thank you for being with us. <laughs> and I know you're super passionate about this as well. And we'll talk, we're, that's what we're going to get into, but please introduce yourself to folks. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a huge pleasure to be here. My name is Lily Zhang. I use they, them pronouns. Um, I am a DEI strategist, consultant, and the author of DEI Deconstructed, your no-nonsense guide to doing the work and doing it right. Um, just a fun fact for you, Kim, I was actually gunning hard to have a swear word in my title. <laughs> um, and it turned out my publishers talked me down from it. But, <sighs> you know, sometimes sometimes I wonder, right, like about the alternate reality where I did, in fact, put a swear word in my title. <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I am thrilled to have this conversation with you today. Lots to dive into, um, you know, not just about the the content that I contributed to your book, but also about this broader conversation that we were just talking about before this conversation um, on DEI and communication and, you know, how leaders can navigate the current landscape and communicate effectively without being part of the problem. Yeah. It, and I found you on LinkedIn. Uh, uh, I've, I've read several of your Harvard Business Review articles I've seen you do a book club for your own book uh, and do other talks as well. And oftentimes you're kind of urging communicators and, and communications to get their act together. And when the, the, I deliberately sought you out, I lost my place in here of where, where oh, here it is. Um, it's towards the end of the, the book. What you contributed was something that you wrote on LinkedIn as a post mm -hmm. And it's called diversity, equity, and inclusion are outcomes. Now that's a paradigm shift for many people, especially communicators who put out diversity reports that list a whole bunch of activities like we're at camp. Yep. Right? Like we're at summer camp. So share with us what you're trying to get across with diversity, equity, and inclusion are outcomes. Yeah. So this is this is a very strong opinion I have, and it comes from First of all, we need to understand the backdrop of diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts happening right now, not just in America, but around the world, in the sense that they are very performative. And what that means is we have a whole bunch of efforts that are predicated on action and activity, but not necessarily accountability, impact, or outcomes. And so you see organizations, leaders, and so on putting forward these initiatives. They might start ERGs, employee resource groups. They might invite speakers in for talks. They might have courageous conversations. And that's all well and good. Sometimes I, in fact, recommend companies do these exact things. But many leaders lose track of the fact that these are all interventions. These are all things that we do in the hopes of creating greater diversity, greater equity, and greater inclusion. And like all good social scientists, whenever I see something like this, my first question is not, do people care? The answer is always yes. But does it work? Because we, we can't just be, you know, throwing things willy nilly at problems and expecting that just because we're good people, we've solved the problem. But it turns out when you dig into it, a lot of these initiatives simply don't work. They don't increase diversity. They don't make people feel a greater sense of inclusion or belonging. They don't address inequity, discrimination, injustice, all of these things. And so we have an environment where there's a lot of talk. In fact, there's sometimes a lot of action, but it's not effective action. And in the face of all of this, employees, staff members, junior employees, they're starting to wise up. They, they might not see the hard data, but they feel like, you know what? We've had this conversation for the 10th time this year and I'm still getting discriminated against. We've had trainings for the fifth time this year and my manager still can't get anything right. Is this DEI work doing anything? Is it working? 
And in the context of all this, we have communicators trumpeting and celebrating all of these DEI things happening and saying, we've made so much progress. We're not going to quantify our progress. We've done these 10 things. And last year, we only did eight things. So that's an improvement of two more things that we did this year, none of which right. actually work, but they don't say that part. Right. And, and this, this is a this is an existential threat to the effectiveness of DEI work. If we just keep spinning our gears and not achieving anything, we're steadily draining the trust of the communities we're working on behalf of and contributing to this cynicism that DEI work is just hot air, right? And, and so this is why I contributed that post, that section on DEI as outcomes. We need to center all of our work on this very simple question. What is it achieving? What's changed? What has the initiative that we proposed done? What is different? And if the answer is we don't know, we can't tell or nothing, then it's on us to do better and to do different and to hold ourselves accountable for designing initiatives that work rather than simply throwing the kitchen sink at a wall, not even seeing what sticks and patting ourselves on the back for a job well done, right? Like that's not acceptable in this current climate. We need to be doing effective DEI work. And communications folks are contributing to this vague, ambiguous, non-specific kind of goals. And some of that is because leaders aren't necessarily, I have compassion for leaders to a certain extent because they didn't get to where they are because they're awesome at DEI, you know? Sure. And so, and then everyone looks at them, especially during at this, you know, the beginning of the summer of 2020 saying, do something, do something. And they're in over their heads. They're used to having all the answers. They don't have answers to this, but I would, uh, you work with a lot of CEOs and a lot of C-suites, a lot of executives. And so what are some of the more problematic areas that you've seen with your clients and how they communicate DEI efforts, especially from a, an executive level? Well, the challenge is that most people aren't able to quantify their progress. They, they don't have good information on what they achieved. And unfortunately, they also don't have the perspective to realize that they don't have that information. And so the biggest assumption I see leaders making is that everything they try is inherently successful simply because they've tried it. Great. And that, that undergirds every sort of communications faux pas, right? It's not that leaders know purposefully that what they're doing doesn't work and they're lying. That's not the case. It's that leaders have no idea that what they're doing works and more importantly, don't care. They don't realize it. They say, well, of course, starting an ERG would help. I have no way of knowing what's changed or what's different, but I'm sure it's doing something. I'm sure bringing in a speaker helps in some way. I have no idea how, but I'm sure it's working. And that naive optimism, I'm sure it's working. I'm sure it's done something actually gets leaders in a lot of trouble because it turns out the large majority of these naive interventions, these poorly designed DEI efforts don't work. In fact, sometimes they backfire and even cause more harm than good. Mm -hmm. And so that's a huge misstep, right? Leaders don't understand that the bar is actually pretty high. It's not that you can do any DEI thing and, and at worst it'll be ineffective. No, at worst it actually harms marginalized communities. It harms women, people of color, disabled folks, queer and trans folks, folks right? Like, so... That's mistake number one. I think mistake number two is that leaders put a lot of their personal stock and pride in these sorts of initiatives. They say, well, if I funded this initiative, then not, not only does it have to work by definition because I'm a good person and of course it works, but anyone who criticizes me must have it out for me. And so there's this inability to take feedback or criticism, even if it's like, you know, not malicious at all. Even if it's, hey, you know, this initiative that you started, we collected data on it and it turns out it's not actually moving the needle. A lot of leaders take that personal. Instead of saying, wow, I had no idea. Let's retool this initiative to make sure it works. They say, are you challenging my commitment to DEI? Are you saying I'm a bad person? Are you saying I don't care? 
And so they double down on their ineffective initiative. They double down on their communication and it turns into a sort of PR exercise of, you know, you versus the leader who now has a personal stake in, in this, this initiative that it isn't working being seen as positive. And to, to bring it all back to communicators, right? Because that's where we started this conversation. I think oftentimes communicators are caught in the crossfire. They also don't have the data, which we can talk about that being a problem. But as a result, communicators who are doing their jobs, which are, you know, there's a message that, that they need to get out and they do a great job communicating it, can inadvertently become essentially DEI money launderers, right? Taking the complete lack of progress and laundering it into a nice, shiny set of communications, which on its own is a brilliant, you know, work of comms work, but in the broad scheme of things contributes to the problem. It allows leaders to avoid accountability. And in some ways it even gaslights the marginalized communities that are continually not seeing progress. Because how, how might it feel like to be a junior employee, a woman, a person of color, a disabled person, a queer trans person, continually getting discriminated against week after week, month after month, seeing nothing change, only to see your company put out this shiny report saying, we've made a strong stance against discrimination. It Discrimination doesn't live here. Diversity is woven into the fabric of our DNA. And we at Blank Company are proud to be champions of DEI and will continue pushing our industry for like, oh my gosh, like that, that just makes me feel awful. I mean, it makes me feel like shit, right? Because I'm here having these awful experiences. And meanwhile, the only thing my company says about it is this laundered PR sounding communications. Yeah. Right. And, and communicators don't want to be part of that problem, but I don't think enough communicators realize that that's on them to speak up and to say, look, I'm not going to write nice copy for you unless you are absolutely certain that the things you're telling me to make good, you know, to, to make shiny are actually real and you have hard data to back it up. Um, comms people need to be accountability, uh, workers, right? Like they, they need to be people who are able to hold the leaders who are giving them things to buff and make shiny. Um, yeah, they they, they need to be able to hold those leaders accountable. Ah. I agree with everything you said. And thank you for really, you know, just exposing the situation and and putting the accountability in there. One of the things that I talk about is visibility drives accountability. And that mm-hmm. could be a secret, you know, like a super strength of communicators saying, I'm not going to put out this diversity uh, report because it's these activities and there's not these outcomes. And the kind of language that we're using is not how we talk to another human being it's not even conversational but it's it's really really missing depth which is why my co-author and i you know talk about the framework of depth like we have to get below the surface it's like i can understand if that was like step one years ago but mm -mm, post george floyd mm -mm. (laughs) unacceptable not okay and it also gives leaders this excuse to say see dei doesn't work Hmm. Yeah. And that's very frustrating, you know, because communicators, my thing with communicators is, hey, we don't, as communicators, and many of them look like me, statistically, they look like me. So they don't have the lived experience, they don't have professional experience, they don't have the experience in general to really truly understand what diversity, equity, inclusion work actually is. So it it's like a goodwill thing. That's how, you know, some of us were introduced to it is this goodwill thing, like for pride. We're recording mm-hmm. this in May. It's, uh, you know, how do, how do you call this Heritage Month? What term do you use? Personally, I call it Asian Heritage Month, but there are lots of acceptable titles. Uh, right now, the, the U.S. Uh, official title is Asian American. Oh, no. Okay, now I'm going to Yep, get myself in trouble. Asian American Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander Heritage Month, I believe right now. And with Pride coming up, we have these opportunities as communicators that are kind of these external factors to recognize that there's these three C's that I use, celebrate, 
crisis and consistency. A lot of com- communicators just stick at the at the celebrate, right? They just stick with the yep. rainbow washing and, and let's change our logo, those kinds of things. Um, but we don't go any 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 deeper than that. We're missing the historical and right. social context of why we have these heritage months um, in the first place. What do you think about all that? What should people be doing differently? I absolutely agree. And I think it's because a lot of communicators that I interact with are really scared of negativity in any form. They're scared to talk about things that are bad or harm that's happened, whether it's in the past or the present, there's this very antiquated notion that the only acceptable way to talk about DEI issues or racism or sexism is as a celebration that we've solved all the problems. And that would be all well and good if we had actually solved all the problems, yeah, right? I like look forward if, to that if, day. <laughs> if we solved racism, like, hell yeah, you know, talk about how we solved that. The problem is we haven't. In, in fact, a lot of challenges are getting worse. And so again, I, I go back to this idea that communicators fear or discomfort with talking about the hard stuff results in laundering essentially of real time harm into this, this very sanitized story of you know progress and triumph and celebration and stuff that looks great on social media until your employees call you out on Twitter for the umpteenth time and then there's another social media controversy and communicators are stuck scratching their heads like, what went wrong? We did all the right things. We talked only about the positive things. Here's the truth. People don't just want to hear about that now. In fact, more and more people are waking up to the fact that things are not all sunshine and rainbows in DEI land. Like racism is not over, sexism is not over. In fact, there are increasing attacks on people of color and women's reproductive rights and LGBTQ plus folks, trans folks, Muslim folks, like it's a rough time. Mm. And people who are, who are very aware of that reality are looking for organizations that get it and realize that we are living in troubled times right now. They're looking for communicators who can, you know, nonetheless represent a brand, but still be real, represent reality also. And that I think is a skill set that a lot of communicators just haven't built. They've, they've been trained in this era where, you know, talking about good news is, is your job and making things that are rough look good is also your job. But now, now there's a huge hunger for realness and honesty and Mm -hmm. embedding that, especially when it comes to social issues, inequality, racism, sexism, transphobia, you name it, is I think the the frontier of effective DEI communications. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Lily. And thank you for this book. This book I know has gone long and far and people are loving it and using it and, and, and putting it to practice. Talk about who, why did you write the book? What problem are you solving with the book? And then you have in here the four levels of achieving DEI. What are those four levels? Yeah. So DEI deconstructed, I, I talk about as my uh, tough love letter to the DEI industry because the same problems I'm pointing out here and talking specifically about as they relate to communicators actually relate to DEI practitioners as well. We've had the same long problem in our industry where we have practitioners who will go into corporations and, you know, will tell their story of being a marginalized person and not being treated well in the workplace and sort of say, now, you know, this is why empathy is so important. We all need to see each other. You know, let's all agree that like racism is bad. And then, you know, people will applaud, they'll collect their paycheck, they'll leave. And the challenge with these sorts of initiatives, again, isn't that they're coming from a bad place or that they're cynical, but that they just don't work on their own. We have a lot of research showing that these sorts of one-off initiatives not only don't work, but sometimes can actually cause more harm than good. But we as DEI practitioners, and also, you know, the leaders who sometimes work with us and bring us in, don't have a good understanding of what outcomes it is we're trying to create. I try to work with all of my clients to identify, you know, this is our point A. This is where we're at. This is what we're doing well. This is what we're not. This is our point B. This is who we want to be. This is what we want to achieve. This is how we know we've gotten there. 
and then to dedicate all of our effort from getting to point A to B, right? That's, that's effective DEI work, making your organization better, more diverse, more equitable, more inclusive, measurably so, trying to measurably improve the experiences of not only marginalized groups, but everyone. Now, this book is essentially the how-to guide on one, how the industry sort of lost its way and some of the challenges that we're facing, and then two, how we can refine our way, how we can we can find a new North Star to guide our effective DEI efforts. It's sort of the, the crystallization of everything I've learned from the last seven or eight years doing DEI work and trying to hold not only my clients, but also other practitioners accountable to achieving real impact, achieving real outcomes, and not just coming in, collecting a check, and not knowing whether we've actually succeeded. It's actually a very parallel problem to the one that communicators face, right? Because I think every communicator wants to know that because of their efforts, they have helped their client or their company talk about something or an issue or a success more positively, right? Like they want to feel like they're doing good. And effective communicators who are able to be honest and center outcomes do in fact do a lot of good. It just takes a different skill set than simply applying your communications degree without any criticality and just laundering whatever comes in front of you, right? DEI is very similar. We can't just go in and use a one size fits all approach and throw unconscious bias training at everyone or tell the same sob story to everyone and just assume because we know in our heart of hearts that somehow we're making some difference that we can't measure, right? We need to be much more accountable than that. And the book is the roadmap for how personally, I think more practitioners can be acting and working to achieve that. Amazing. And there's, there's the four levels that you speak to here. Right. And Oops. I forgot your question entirely. That's okay. And just the four levels. If you don't mind tying in, like what do communicators, what's their role in these four letter levels? Yeah. So the four levels of DEI pertain to the impact of the initiatives that you do on the very most basic level. These are initiatives that anyone can start. They require very little trust built up to do them. And so they're great starting points for DEI. They're things like putting out a DEI statement, making a new DEI mission, starting a DEI council. The thing about this very basic level of initiatives is partially because they're so easy to start, they require very little sort of resources banked up. They don't necessarily achieve much on their own. They lay the groundwork and the infrastructure for more impactful things down the line, right? If you don't have a DEI statement or a DEI mission, it'll be harder to legitimize what happens in the future. So of course that mission or that statement is very powerful. But if you stop there, what have you achieved by making a DEI statement? Zilch, nothing, nothing at all. Right. That's like putting a couple bricks down and calling it a house. That's not a house. You're, you're laying part of a foundation. If you leave out the bricks, you're not going to have a good house, but don't mistake it for a house. The further up you go in the level. So with doing things like investing in DEI professionals, um, resourcing DEI work, creating a DEI strategy, collecting data, understanding what's what your workforce is experiencing, looking into your policies and practices. And then further up from that, drawing on demographic data split by, by level and tenure and all of that to make effective decisions in your organization, holding yourself accountable to external community members, boards of directors, labor unions, using DEI related information to make decisions. These are all far harder initiatives that build on the foundation you've created, but take a lot more gas in the tank. They take more resources. They take having built up a foundation of trust to do, right? So the further up you go in the levels, I, that's, you know, that's a quick cliff notes version of them. We could talk about that for a while, but the further up you go, the harder the initiatives get, but the more payoff they, mm. they, they get you. Now for communicators, why is this good to know? 
because I see way too many communicators pointing at the level one or level zero activities and saying, huzzah, we've done it. Our organization is a huge success. You know, we started an ERG group. We started an employee resource group. We created a DEI statement. Our leader posted on Twitter. And again, that's the same as pointing at a stack of bricks and going, look at this beautiful three-story Victorian house. Isn't it beautiful and incredible, right? And at some point, at some point, someone will point out that the emperor is wearing no clothes. Some people will point out that you're kind of talking out of your ass because you haven't achieved anything. You're pointing at these very initial foundational efforts and mistaking that for real success, right? So what communicators need to do is to get curious. Like you're, you're not just passive communicators. You should really be more like investigative journalists. Yeah. You should, you should look at a situation and say, I'm, I'm not going to just take this sentence you gave me and make it look good. Like, tell me more what's going on. Like, help me tell the story that is both accurate and compelling. Right. And I don't have the information I need to tell that story. So give me information. I want information on how this initiative started, who it impacts, what problem it's solving for, what it's achieved, and how you know it's achieving that. Once I have all that information, I can work my magic as a storyteller to help you get this really compelling narrative of what's happened and why. But I'm not going to tell a story with incomplete data, or worse, I'm not going to fabricate data to tell my story. And if you, the client, don't have that data or you're unwilling to provide that data, then it's only natural that I, as a principled communicator, am not going to do your dirty work for you. And I'm going to sit here and wait on you can un until you can give me what I need to do a good job, right? Mm -hmm. We need more principled stances like that from communicators. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Thank you. Thank you for that. I, and I couldn't agree more. You know, uh, something I've been doing a lot of coaching on uh, with my communication clients is, well, my leader is very hesitant. They're telling me they don't want to do too much too soon. And I'm like, so did you take that as a decision? As like, you know, you put your tail between your legs and you walk out of the room. She's like, well, yeah, you know, and I've heard this in a very variety of, of instances across uh, clients. And I said, well, why is that the end of the conversation when it should be the beginning? Right. So what is too much? What is too soon? Let's play this out. Like, let's let's engage in that conversation. Like you were mentioning the investigative reporter like that. The, the sauce is in the questions and, and the quality of the questions and being able to get to a place where you, we can learn more and then be able to, to your point, be principles and saying, I can't go out there and say that, look at all the, the rivers that we cleaned up and all of the, you know, and all the communities that we wrote checks to and all this without any kind of shift or change, I, you know, that, that we do have to push back and we have to have that kind of conversation. Right. Thank you for saying that. And I, and another thing that, that is something I want folks to take away is that Lily is coming from as a DEI strategist, I'm coming from a DEI communications strategist. You know, we're both about implementation. We're both about outcomes. In our organizations, we need to have this kind of partnership and collaboration between the office of the DEI as well as communications. There has to be this collaboration and this and this partnership, this, this um, uh, transparency and have these hard conversations and then come up with a plan together to go and work with the rest of the stakeholders to bring them along in the work so right. that we have, we're achieving our DEI goals and the communications part of it is, is part of that momentum. Right. I think the, um, something I, I was thinking about as you were sharing that is that I, I also do some DEI comms myself, uh, mostly from the, the viewpoint of someone who does a lot of DEI survey assessment. I end up mm -hmm. assessing companies and writing reports on what I find and mm -hmm. sending that to usually the senior leadership team, the executive team, whatever. And mm -hmm. I always, always, always get pushback on the language I use in my reports mm -hmm. because in my reports, I'll find very, very solid things like I don't know, men in this workplace have 90% belonging and women will only have 30% belonging. 
And so there's a 60% belonging gap that's largely driven by an old boys club, for example, which I've assessed qualitative data to identify. And leaders will say, can you not call it that? Like, can you not use that kind of language? Because I, I always push my clients, I send these reports to the entire company. Like it's, it's not just to the eyes of, of the senior team. I'm like, no, this is what I'm finding. This is my investigation. This is mm -hmm. what I found. And this is what to call it. And leaders will always say, I feel like that's just a little forceful. That's, that's you know, a little controversial language. What else would you call it? Can you please use nicer language or something different? And I push back. I say, then what is it? Like, help me find better wording to describe a systemic pattern where men are excluding women because they are supporting other men and they have... Uh, a fraternal community of boys that is predicated on pushing women out. Help me find another word for that that isn't old boys club, right? Like, frat? You want me to call it a frat party? Like, would you rather I use that language? And they're like, well, no, but like, and, and it turns out their quibble is with the facts, not with the communication, right? Like, they're, they're so scared at the facts getting yes. put out there that they're asking me as the communicator to try to muddle or change the facts. It was never a comms issue, right? It's not about whether I call it a, a frat house or an old boys club or exclusionary behavior from men. They don't even Culture. care about me playing with the words. They want me to not say, like they, they just don't want me to talk about the facts, right? Yeah. And this is where I think principled communicators need to really be thinking about ethics because you're not just wordsmiths like you are folks who are trying to understand the truth and portray it in a in a compelling powerful way and if you're being asked to portray it powerfully but to hide the truth then it's on you to say i'm not going to do that again i, I go back to this investigative journalist metaphor right if you're not willing to do that then you will be used to launder hard truths into nice sounding things. And then I hate to say it, you will be complicit in workplaces continuing to cause more harm. I know communicators don't want that, right? It just requires that you stand up and push back against these sorts of requests. It's, it's hard, right? And it's certainly not what a lot of people were taught to do as communicators. Lily. That was exactly what communicators needed to hear. Tough love, right? And I, I want to respect your schedule and your time, so I'm going to wrap up with this one last question. What does communicating like you give a damn? What does that look like? What does that sound like? What do you want to see different? What do you want to see happen? I want to see communicators recognize that everything they communicate by, by definition, will have an agenda. It has an impact, right? There's no values neutral communication. Everything you do and the way you say it will always affect the outcome. You can communicate to shed light on injustice. You can communicate to cover up injustice. Yes. You can communicate to change systems. You can communicate to uphold systems, right? Everything you do as a communicator embeds your intent, or if not your intent, someone else's intent. So don't be scared to have an opinion, right? Don't be scared to try to uncover the truth and find out what's actually happening because unless you absolutely make sure that your communications reflects the truth, the actual truth, your communications will always be used as a tool to advance someone else's agenda, if not your own. And you want to be sure that the agenda you are advancing is one that you are comfortable with and that feels ethical to you. To me, that means making sure you are always accountable to the truth, first and foremost, not just what your boss tells you to do. Yes. Yes. Okay. Rewind. Hit the little 15 second thing. Listen to all that again. Listen to that until it really sinks in. Take a deep breath and just know that you're not alone in this work. There's a lot of communicators going through this work. There's a lot of DEI practitioners that need you to do this work. Lily, your book is incredible. 
And I encourage all communicators to pick it up because you need to know what the work actually is. What actually is DEI so you can write about it more accurately. So you get it. So you know what you're talking about and you can understand you write, then you read our book and learn more about like, oh, that's pretty performative. That's what Kim and Lily were talking about on that podcast. Lily, it was such a pleasure to hang out with you and have this conversation. And I hope it's first of many to come. Any last uh, parting thoughts and how can people stay in contact with you? Yeah, I'll, I'll just say the pleasure was all mine. I, I think this is a really critical conversation. Um, I, I want to add too that it's not just that communicators can learn more about DEI so that they can write about it. It's that writing effectively about this work is DEI. Like yes. you are DEI practitioners, you are DEI communicators if you're able to understand this content and to write about the truth, what's happening or what isn't happening, right? So so I encourage you not to see yourself as as fundamentally separate from DEI work. Like this is DEI work. You are doing it every single time you hold yourself and your employers accountable. And it's 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 hard, but it's not as hard as you might think, right? It just requires a different mm -hmm. way of going about this work and and holding yourself accountable. So uh, mm -hmm. myself and my work, I think the, the two places you can learn most about me are LinkedIn. You can find me at Lily Zhang on LinkedIn or my website, uh, www.lilyzhang.co. You can learn more about me and my work and my books. Um, yeah, and and... I just want to thank you, Kim, for inviting me to have this conversation with you. And I want to thank all the listeners who have tuned in up until this point. I truly believe that all of us who are having this conversation and listening uh, can become more effective communicators and can make sure that we hold ourselves and our clients accountable to the future we deserve, right? Instead of upholding and a problematic past or present, right? Like we, we can do so much better. That serves someone else. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lily. It was a pleasure. It was an honor. Thank you for having me. So what popped out to you from the conversation? The more conscious communicators in the world, the better the world. So go to communicate like you give a damn podcast.com and set up a one-on-one -on -one strategy session. And until next time, let's keep taking care of each other.